welcome back to Sailing Good Old Boats, or if you're new, welcome. On today's episode, we are talking about the famous 9.2a by S2 yachts. Yeah, guys, so thanks for tuning back in. Um, exciting stuff is happening right now. We are looking for our next boat because we want to sail on that bad boy here. One of the biggest freshwater lakes in the world. Some say the biggest by surface area anyways. It's Lake Superior. And uh, we have already a few hot contenders and we want to take you along as we are looking and evaluating. So... Today's episode, as we already gave away, will be about the 9.2a. But before we start talking about the boat itself, we should maybe mention Leon and Estuniards. That's a good point, actually, because there's a story behind it. So you might have heard about Slickcraft from the 60s. That was actually a powerboat company, and that was founded by Leon Slickers. So um, he founded this company and it was super successful and I think end of the 60s, I believe in 69 or so, he ended up selling it. And uh, it must have been a great deal and um, another company swallowed it up. And um, yeah, so the story goes that he had to sign a non-compete agreement. <laughs> so it tells me about uh, how afraid they must have been about his right. genius because they made him sign actually a non-compete agreement. He's, he, he, yeah, so he stuck with them, however, for a while uh, until '73 or so, before they parted ways, before um, he became uh, disenchanted and uh, with the company. And um, yeah, so there was no mentioning in that uh, agreement about sailboats. It was only about powerboats. Yeah. Right. Uh, so they couldn't tie his hands about making uh, sailboats. So. <laughs> He took off and built a brand new facility in Holland, Michigan, right off the shores of Lake Michigan. And there was something really new. He pioneered there a little bit uh, in the sense that he uh, built a climate-controlled environment because he wanted to make the highest quality polyester resin fiberglass uh, hulls out there. So he built this very new plant and starts producing S2 yards. So he found that company, and there it is, S2 Yachts, in 1974. And um, they had like a relatively short run, actually, before he uh, closed doors again. Um, the main production, actually, the biggest bulk of boats that he pumped out was up until 1980, and then it continued on a little yes. bit further. Until, it was nine years. Yeah, something like that, yeah. you know. But it was actually astonishing how many boats he made, yeah. you know. He did, yeah. You might have heard about that very famous uh, class racer, the 7.9. That is a really famous boat. They actually came back, the class association came back to Leon and asked him to fire up that production line again for the 7.9 mm -hmm. after they were already out of production because... They were still racing that in the fleet, and they wanted to have replacements for the old boats. Mm -hmm. So um, he actually did them. They agreed on a run of 10 boats initially, and um, they couldn't really sell them all. So it was kind of the end of it, unfortunately. But that tells you about how good those boats were. I mean, right. there was a real racing fleet around this, you know, and they mm -hmm. desperately wanted to have more. They wanted to mm -hmm. have replacements, you know, I said, like, come, please. Uh, fire up that production run one more time and give us 10 more boats or so, you know, mm -hmm. and he did that. Mm -hmm. um, but anyhow, that's not the boat we're talking about. This, the 7.9 is a different boat. It's a racer. What we are talking about today, the 9.2A, is actually more like uh, an offshore racer in that class. So it's a very interesting boat. And uh, what I want to mention before we dive right into that is he produced them to the highest quality standards. So not only did he control the environment with temperature and relative humidity to make perfect polyester boats, he also made 
um, them in the negative mold and contrary to other manufacturers that would go for speed and as soon as the boat is done in the mold they would take it out and then you know put the hulls next to one another as they pump them out of the mold and start building the boat up with the structural components and so forth and so on so that they could produce more of them in a given time you know that makes sense yeah he didn't do that he wanted to be the boat as form true as possible so he was afraid that the boat would twist or warp in a weird way if he takes it out of the of the negative mode before the inner structural members are there. So basically they built up the interior of the boat first while the boat was still sitting in its supported mode and only then when all the structural members and bulkheads were properly secured to the actual hull because it doesn't have an inner liner, most of them don't, then they actually took the boat out to make sure it had already a stuck structural integrity and wouldn't warp or twist or any of that. So mm -hmm. He wanted to have basically one boat looking exactly like the other and he wanted to do it as perfect as possible. So that is where that reputation for S2 yachts comes from that they build extremely high quality polyester fiberglass composite boats. And That's I'm, interesting. It is. And I must say, you know, as we are looking at this boat here today, I was astonished by the quality of the molding, for instance, of the non-skid on deck. You can tell that fiberglass gel coat is much uh, thicker mm -hmm. than you would see that with other manufacturers. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I didn't see any spider cracks in that boat. And that was from around, I don't know, mid eighties or so. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that that's a boat that has seen some wear and tear. And you can tell just by the way the decks look like mm -hmm. how strong and how beefy he laid that up so it is it is definitely true that leon took care of predominantly of quality assurance and he really implemented very high standards for a quality assurance program so i think that is relatively unique it is all right you guys what do you figure shall we have a look at it let's do it okay here's a 9.2a as an aft cockpit. First, the sailboat data, the general data. So she's a fin keel with a skeg rudder, and I purposefully did not write skeg hung rudder because the skeg is just placed in front of the rudder without being connected anywhere at the lower end of it. So it doesn't really supports the rudder that way structurally. She is a masthead sloop. As you can see, the fore sail goes all the way up to the mast top. And she was powered for auxiliary power with a Yanma 2GM 15 horse diesel. Her bunker capacity for water is 37 US gallons and for diesel 30 gallons. Her construction is solid hand laid fiberglass. The hulls with S2s are really well made. The deck is balsa cord and the, the um, gel coat on hull and deck is really generous. It's thick and um, the, the non skid, for instance, on the deck is marvelous. They did a very good job on that molding. The ballast is lead and is encapsulated, so there's no keel bolts to worry about. And the boat was in production from 1977 to 1987. There have been 946 hulls manufactured during this production run between the aft co cockpit model and the center cockpit model. You can see a 520 aft cockpits and 426 center cockpit bolts. The builder is S2 Yachts, as already discussed, and the designer behind this boat is Arthur Edmonds. Moving on to the sailboat specifications. Her length overall, I also refer to length on deck sometimes, is 22.92 feet, and next to it you see metrics. Her length of the waterline is 25 feet on the dot, and her beam 10. 0.25 foot. Sail area 468 square feet and draft of 
4.92. Her displacement 9,800 pounds and out of that ballast will be 4,000 pounds. So now that we have the specifications, we can crunch some numbers. Let's move over to sailboat performance calculations. So we take all of that and what comes out is a sail area of displacement of 16.41. So she is well canvassed, not over canvassed. Her ballast to displacement comes out at 40.82, so about 41% which is good. And displacement to length of 280 suggests that she has been gener generously laid up. So the construction quality um, is, is, is good. It's, it doesn't seem to be an extremely light built boat. The comfort ratio therefore comes out at 25.77 and her capsize screening formula at 1.92 so clearly under two suggests that she was designed for some offshore work. Her performance handicap racing formula value is at 189 seconds per mile and her hull speed nominal at 6.7 and her pounds per inch immersion is around 900 pounds. That looks very good. All the numbers in total look very appealing to me. That seems to be a well-rounded design. Last but not least, a few notes. So the boat was produced as an aft cockpit model with a regular fin keel, and that's the one we are looking at here today. There's also a shore draft model available, and that would be about a foot uh, less deep and then there's a center cockpit version and that also came as a shore draft version as well. Okay, let's have a look at the boat itself now and uh, we start out with a brief overview of the cockpit area. The cockpit seems to be relatively spacious for a boat of this size and it has a relatively modern layout with high combings, it gives you a safe and secure feel. The pedestal steering wheel has been pushed all the way aft and there is a cutout left and right for the helmsman to move around as he or she tries to find his or her balance in the seaway. However, she does lack a proper um, bridge deck and the companionway entrance has been lowered for the ease of access to the salon area which comes at the price of safety. From here we move on to have a closer look at the entire deck. Her overall deck layout is also wide and open and allows for plenty of space to move fore and aft. It makes it a breeze really with those side stays having been moved all the way towards the hull deck joint outward so you can move underneath them. Also if you look closer here at the non-skid molding, um, this has been done marvelously. Really beautiful. Um, the hull deck joint seems to be an inner flange that is disguised here with an aluminum tow rail. And then also here if you pay attention to the push bit or pull bit up front, this has been done extremely strong. She also in this case here carries two anchors because she has a really generous size anchor locker that allows you to have a lot of chain put away down there. And that is also molded into the deck pan. And then the mast is a single spreader aluminum rig with uh, aluminum mast and boom. This particular model as a bonus there was a Harken roller furling unit which is always really nice to have. It's a high quality uh, furling system. To port uh, there is an opening for wastewater and then to starboard fresh water and the diesel tank can be accessed from the cockpit area. 
The forward ventilation hatch is wide enough to climb in and out or drop sails down into the beavers if needed. Now it's time to step down below and we'll uh, start out as a salon area with the galley and the nav station. Setting it. The rest of today, Grand Portage to Grand Marais. The nav station and the electrical panel is situated to port right when you step down the companionway entrance and there's a fold down table with plenty of space behind for all kinds of electrical gadgets. And you can take out one of the boards that's a pilot berth and then you have basically a seating arrangement that allows you to sit in front of that table. Now the galley is arranged L shape and to starboard just across the nav station with an ice box, a deep sink and a gimbal stove. As you can see here, all the deck hardware is properly secured and backed up with washers and nuts. The ice box is really deep. I don't know where it drains into, I think into the bilge. There is plenty of storage for everything and even a garbage chute that allows you to keep your garbage in the starboard locker out of the way, which is really nice and uh, plenty of storage everywhere for pots and pans and cutlery. As you can see here the boat comes with a three burner propane stove with an oven. The entire unit is gimbaled so that allows you to cook while underway as the boat heals over. The overall craftsmanship is quite impressive. Everything looks really nice. The wood in this boat here is in good shape. As you can see, I like that all the chain plates are open and accessible, easy to check. The table folds up against the bulkhead and the port side city can slide out to make for a double berth. The starboard city comes with a footwell that allows you to utilize this possibly as a sea berth with a leak loss that would be ideal midship. So the entire seating arrangement is spacious enough to seat six people in comfort easily. I can't help myself but to marvel over these beautiful teak and holly floors. There are access panels everywhere so you can get to the actual hull. Hence there are no inner liners. Everything is secured directly to the hull. From here we make our way forward into the Webers and have a closer look at the arrangements around the Webers. Yeah, to be perfectly frank with you, the Webers itself struck me as rather simple. As you can see, there's not much storage in the Webers itself and there's this carpet-like material that's inside of the hull and deck because the boat has no inner fiberglass liners, so that's there to make it pretty. It's relatively snug, but I'd say you can uh, sleep Two adults up there, no problem. Everything is through board is secured. Here's a hanging locker, and next to it is another double side locker, and that's just across from the head. Now, moving back in the boat again, we will have a closer look at the head with the shower. That is a head, nice marine head with holding tank. We got a little ventilation window in here. So, a shower, you got a floor pan that can be used to shower in here, there's the shower head. More storage, and more storage underneath, and the um, sea cocks for the out. Our, Oh yeah, we go past that, and that is already ball valves, and it should be. Yeah. And before we step outside again, we will also have a quick sneak peek into the engine compartment with that Yanmar diesel.
As relatively common for a boat of this size and vintage is the diesel engine, the two-cylinder Yanma 15 horsepower, situated right underneath the companionway entrance. Removing the companionway stairs or steps out of the way, uh, you gain pretty good access to the engine uh, for service and repairs. And down below you see a relatively deep bilge. As I said, the keel ballast is encapsulated and therefore there are no keel bolts. Unfortunately, it is relatively tough to get to the bilge itself because everything is arranged in such a fashion that there is no real access. And then behind the engine tucked away is the diesel tank. It seems to be made from aluminum. It's right underneath the floor of the cockpit itself. However, engine access overall is relatively good. You can get to everything you need to for regular service. As we're having a closer look here, that's the make and model, it's a 2GMF. That's an older but very reliable two cylinder diesel engine that runs on the sniff of an oily rug, so to speak. Now, let's take a moment to honor our newest Patreon with a big Patreon shout out. This time around, it goes over to Stuttgart, Germany, for our newest Hansman level Patreon. Thanks for coming aboard and helping us to keep this ship on course. Marcus, your contributions are truly much appreciated. If you liked today's episode, please smash that like button, share and subscribe, or consider becoming a Patreon. We hope to see you soon on, on Sailing Good Old Boats. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, it's an Arctic uh, vortex out there, <laughs> but who cares? The barbecue anyways. It's all about the spirit, they say. It's all about the spirit. All right, here we go. Okay, yeah. Yes, it's a little worse than I thought it was, but you know what? We'll, we'll be fine. It's Minnesota barbecue. That's a Minnesota. Keep it. Seriously. Come on. That's Minnesota barbecue. That's what it is, you know? Yeah. I mean, we are far away from. It's still a sailing channel, by the way. I keep saying that. Nobody will believe me anymore. I think so. So here we go. Oh, it's actually frozen. There we go. It's almost made. Almost made. But you know what? If you keep that spirit in your heart going, you'll be just fine. Look, here in Minnesota, guess what? Your spatula is also your ice cream. Well, just to get that mixed pizza off your barbie. So you can actually see what you're dining in upon. That's cool. You know, you gotta adjust to the conditions. But little dude is very happy about the snow. 